We're uh, back and uh, the appearances are as we're, outside, we're back and outside the presence of the jury and uh, appearances are as before and ready to roll. I want to put two things quickly on the record, Your Honor. Number one, on Friday the parties received a high definition copy of a video uh, drone footage that we all previously had lower resolution copies of. It's from a source uh, identified as Brandon Beeman or Urban Unaired, um, Urban Aired, something like that. Um, and I believe there's a, an agreement that that's going to be added to our stipulated list of uh, authentic videos so that we won't need a witness to lay a foundation of authenticity as to that. Is that correct? This is a correct statement. Okay. And second of all, Your Honor, the next witness is going to be Gage Grosskreutz. I believe there's an agreement among the parties that he has one prior criminal conviction. All right. Is that yes. accurate? Yes, that's correct. Um, all right, let's uh, go. Oh, yeah, I suppose I should do that. <laughs> um, it's Monday. <laughs> Starting without the reporter is a common Hello. problem. Would you come down, please? Yes. Uh, it's a con common problem, but uh, I don't think I ever started without the jury. All right, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody had a, a restful and uh, entertaining weekend, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, the Bears play tonight, right? Okay, so oh, you're smiling a lot. I assume that you're a Bear fan? How many, how many Packer fans? How many Bear fans? Eh, about a typical split for Kenosha. Okay, great. Well, uh, everybody enjoy the game, not necessarily the outcome. Uh, all right, let's go. The state calls Gage Grosskreutz. Please state your name and spell your first and last name for the record. Gage, G-A-I-G-E, Grosskreutz, G-R-O-S-S-K-R-E-U-T-Z. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? Yes. How many times? One. What city do you currently live in? Milwaukee. And uh, did you grow up in Milwaukee? For the most part, yes. W did you have any experiences growing up that uh, made you want to get into the medical field? Um, many, I think. Um, I remember being uh, a young child, um, 
my grandma was employed as a uh, registered nurse at uh, Columbia St. Mary's in Milwaukee. Um, like I said, being a small child, I remember her teaching me how to use a stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff. I'd say that was probably my er earliest memory uh, when I decided that uh, I wanted to pursue a career in medicine. Where did you go to high school? West Dallas Central. When did you graduate? 2012. And did you find opportunities to put that early desire to go into medicine uh, into practice? Oh, yes. Tell us about that. Um, I remember when I was a sophomore in high school and I was on the swim team and my swim captain had come up to me and asked if I wanted a job as a lifeguard. Um, so from there I worked for the Milwaukee Lifeguard Corps um, and then from there I went to school to be an EMT basic. After completing that course I then worked as a EMT on a private ambulance in Milwaukee can you tell us a little bit about what you had to do to complete that course? So EMT basic is, uh, I believe, 160, maybe 180 hours. Essentially, that comes to a, a couple days a week out of a out of a semester. Uh, and then following that, after a successful completion of the coursework at the college, um, you then take two nationally uh, registered um, courses or tests, I should say. Um, one is a psychomotor course, um, so that's uh, a psychomotor course, uh, test, exam, um, and that's essentially the hands-on technical skills. And then there's a cognitive exam, um, and it is uh, a computerized exam where you take multiple choice questions in various fields of uh, pre-emergency uh, hospital care. Was those two classes that you described, were those necessary to finish up the EMT basic program? Correct. And was there anything else you needed to do to finish up that program? Um, apart from submitting an application to be licensed through the state, um, that's essentially it. Are you familiar with the requirements in order to become an EMT in Wisconsin? I am. What are those requirements? Um, so just to recap, uh, finishing some sort of college coursework, whether it's an EMT basic um, or if you go on for an advanced EMT or an EMT paramedic. So the coursework, the coursework through the accredited college is the first thing. And then following that is the, uh, like I said, the two uh, national uh, registry of EMT or emergency medical technicians uh, exams that you take once you complete those and pass them. Um, then you submit an application to whatever jurisdiction that you'll be working in. Um, because while you might learn, you know, this much, you're only able to potentially do this much given local protocols and, and laws. Did you complete all of that yourself? I did. Did you obtain a certification from the state of Wisconsin to be an EMT? I did. And did you put that into practice? I did. How so? Um, like I mentioned before, I worked for a private ambulance in Milwaukee uh, for a number of years. Did you continue on in uh, the field uh, to get more advanced training or more advanced certification after that? I did. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so when I was working uh, as an EMT basic, um, I decided that I really enjoyed it um, and I wanted to advance my knowledge, my expertise, my experiences <coughs> and I went back to school to uh, Waukesha uh, County Technical College and this is where I took the EMT paramedic course. Can you tell us about that course? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, the EMT paramedic course, um, I guess a, a quantitative way to uh, differentiate the two. EMT basic is about 180 hours of class time and EMT paramedic is about 1600. Um, so for the specific course that I took at Waukesha County Technical College, uh, I took 34 credits in a semester. Uh, the way that this course was structured is um, you would take a morning class, a morning class and an afternoon class. Um, and this would go on for the entire semester. Um, these classes would be for example, one of the first two courses that I took was one course specific in treating trauma and then uh, medical emergencies. So there's a difference between those two. So morning class, afternoon class, and then at the end of two weeks in this kind of condensed, really fast paced, really hard hitting course courses, you would then take the exam for those. And then as long as you passed with a B or higher, you were then essentially able to move on to the next segment. So if at any point in this program you were to fail a course, say you failed your morning class halfway through, 
but you passed your afternoon class, you would have to wait for the next uh, academic semester to to, um, to to go back to reattend. And were you able to make it through that entire program? I was. Is that true for everybody else in your class? It is not. What was the kind of the dropout rate, if if you will? Um, from what I remember, we had about 25 to 30 uh, students. I was one of maybe 10 that passed. Once you finished all of that coursework, did you get any new license or certification? I did. And what was that called? Uh, that is the EMT paramedic certification. Is that from the state of Wisconsin? That is. Do you remember approximately when you obtained that? That would have been um, 2014, I want to say. Can you help us understand the difference between an EMT and a paramedic? Uh, yes, I can. Um, the, like I said, a quantitative way to delineate the two is the amount of coursework. Um, a simpler way that I like to put it to people is uh, paramedics can put new holes in people. So some of the, sorry, would you like to go ahead? Some of the things, for example, are administering IV medications, so knowing how to start an IV. Um, also, <coughs> cardiocentes sorry, cardiocentesis, um, which is essentially a life-saving uh, maneuver which involves um, extracting fluid from the heart. Um, there's also a great deal of pharmacology knowledge that needs to be known. For example, uh, EMTs, EMT basics, can administer six different kinds of medications. Paramedics, and again, it depends on the jurisdiction that you're working in, but nationally, uh, you're taught a little over 50 different kinds of medications. And that's ju not just names, but it's indications, contraindications, or when to use it, when to not use it, um, dosages, which can be dependent on weights, age, um, and then there's also um, just the general knowledge that's known. So while there are a lot more technical skills that you learn and pharmacology and things like that, it's also being able to identify and properly assess. After you obtained your certification as a paramedic, did you uh, work in that field? I did. Can you tell us about that? Um, like I said, I had been previously employed on a private ambulance uh, as an EMT basic. I then continued to work um, on a private ambulance as an EMT paramedic. Did you ever do any of that work here in Kenosha? In Kenosha, no, but in Racine. Um, I worked for Erickson Ambulance for a time. During your time working as a paramedic with that private ambulance company, what sort of uh, medical emergencies did you have to respond to? Um, so Erickson Ambulance does um, primarily, uh, well, I think almost exclusively, what's called inter-facility transports. Um, so it's not like when somebody calls 911, Erickson Ambulance is the one to respond. Um, versus like in Milwaukee, um, there's a, essentially the, these, these calls are shared with the fire department and private ambulances, so the private ambulances kind of back up the firefighters. Um, but specifically for Erickson Ambulance and Racine, when I worked as an EMT paramedic, um, our general patient population were elderly people. Um, so this was, I mean, a, a, range, a, a range of emergencies, anywhere from diabetic issues to uh, potentially um, mental health issues. There's always the, the chance and, um, or the chance of trauma. Um, say somebody falls. Um, cardiac issues are also a, a, a big, well, <coughs> A more, um, I guess, ubiquitous thing with with uh, the geriatric, uh, sorry, uh, cardiovascular emergencies are a lot more common given the age of geriatric patients. Do you remember approximately how long you worked as a paramedic? <clears throat> I'll say about a year. Were there ever times in which you had to deal with someone suffering from a gunshot wound? Yes, I have. What was that like? It's difficult. Um, gunshots can be very traumatic. Uh, and I mean traumatic in the sense of the, the physiology of what it can do to the body. Obviously, there are n you know numerous factors that go into it, the size of the, the caliber, where the person's shot, how many times. Um, and 
when you are practicing in school, it is much different from when you actually go and put your hands on somebody who is is bleeding. Um, there's <laughs> lots of blood, um, screaming. Generally speaking, there's somebody there that's frantic. So that not only are you having to focus on the patient, but you have to deal with the surrounding situation, which can be potentially, like I said, a frantic family member, say if it's an accident or uh, self-inflicted. Um, but also, it can be a dangerous situation to go into because, generally speaking, I mean, you, you shoot people to hurt them, and there's always that potential of continued on-scene violence. Um, so it can be very hectic. Um, it definitely doesn't get easier the more you do it. Uh, maybe going through the motions, um, you know, going through your, your mental checklist of things that you need to need to do. Um, but it definitely doesn't get easier watching that, hearing that. Since you obtained your paramedic certification from the state of Wisconsin, have you continued your education in that field? I have. Can you tell us about that? Um, I went to school to uh, for outdoor education. And naturally through that field, um, you are finding yourself in remote areas where there is going to be some form of delayed care, meaning, <clears throat> meaning that you are unable to get to a hospital within an hour. Um, and that's commonly referred to as the golden hour, specifically with uh, trauma patients. Uh, I <clears throat> then took a uh, wildland firefighter course, uh, which I did complete. And then I also took uh, what's called wilderness first responder, which is the pretty, um, it's essentially the industry standard for uh, people who work in uh, the outdoor industry. Um, yeah. Have you uh, worked in the outdoor industry, as you say? I have. What kind of work have you done? My first job uh, in the outdoor industry was working as a sea kayak guide in the Apostle Islands. Um, a sea kayak guide in the Apostle Islands? Is that right? Correct. Go ahead. Um, and then from there, um, naturally through schooling and opportunities, I primarily worked with children, um, middle school age. And also from there, I was a, um, or am an American Canoe Association uh, sea kayaking instructor. So I actually teach people how to effectively sea kayak. Um, bit of context, uh, specifically for where I worked in the Apostle Islands, Lake Superior is very cold get very windy, which means very wavy, so it's maybe just a little bit more intense than maybe paddling around your lake cabin. Yeah. Are you continuing your studies today? I am. And how close are you to finishing those up? I have one more class that I need to complete to receive my bachelor's uh, in outdoor education. I want to turn your attention, Mr. Grosskreutz, to the, the summer of the year 2020. Um, and we're going to lead up to August 25th. But before that, um, did you spend time that summer uh, attending any protests or demonstrations? I did. Can you tell us about that? After the death of George Floyd, um, I found myself demonstrating in Milwaukee. Uh, this was, I want to say, maybe two days after George Floyd's death. and. I was out um, with a friend of mine who I actually took EMT BASIC with, and we were out demonstrating. Um, we were seeing what the scene was like. Um, I'm sorry, seeing what the scene was like. Um, we didn't make signs or anything like that, but we, like I said, we found ourselves down in Milwaukee. Um, and when you say you were demonstrating, what exactly were you <laughs> doing? Well, I think... What I was specifically doing was just being in attendance. But I want to make sure we understand what you mean by demonstrating. Um, were there people damaging property? No. Lighting fires? No. Uh, was there any violent clash with police? No. What time of day, if you recall, were these uh, demonstrations? Um, that specific first one, generally, late morning into late afternoon. Um, yeah. So what would 
other folks be doing at these demonstrations? People would be holding signs. They would be chanting various things, um, driving cars down down the street. Um, yeah. And you said you initially were there just kind of to see the scene. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, correct. And, and tell us what happened after that. So after walking for a few hours, um, kind of starting to wrap the day up, and all of a sudden somebody starts yelling, medic, medic. Um, and I'm walking, like I said, with my friend who I took EMT basic with, and he looks at me and he says, that, that's you. I was like, oh, I guess you're right. <laughs> Um, and then I came over uh, to a patient who had uh, tripped and fallen over a curb. Uh, my guess is they just weren't paying attention, got their, got their feet caught up. Um, and the patient was, was all right after an assessment, um, advised to go to the hospital. Um, following that, though, I noticed that there was no established or even organized sort of first aid presence at these demonstrations. Um, and from there, uh, I was talking with my friend who I had taken EMT basic with, and we decided that we were going to offer our services voluntarily. And did you do that? We did. Tell us about that experience. So, I had uh, talked to some of the prominent organizers uh, in Milwaukee, and we kind of laid out a, a game plan or you know, uh, how we were going to organize this. Um, essentially, as medics, we decided that we weren't going to be actively uh, participating in any of the demonstrations. Uh, I think there's a essentially a, a, an ethic code that if you are providing medical care, you shouldn't necessarily choose a side um, because everybody has the right to protest or demonstrate, assemble, freedom of speech, but also everybody has the right to do that safely. So very early on we decided that we weren't going to actively participate uh, in these demonstrations. From there, uh, my friend and I <coughs> outfitted his uh, pickup truck into a, essentially a, a mobile first aid station. In the time period that followed after that, uh, did you and your friend with this mobile first aid station um, provide medical assistance at these uh, demonstrations? Yes, we did. On approximately how many occasions would you say you did that? I think it's re relevant for many reasons. Um, it's establishing his background as a paramedic, uh, which was come, came into play on this particular evening. I think it also is uh, drawing a contrast between him and the defendant. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, overrule the objection on the first ground. How many, approximately how many times would you say you were out there providing medical care at these demonstrations? I would say about 75 days prior to um, August. Okay. And during that time period, what sort of medical situations would you assist in? Primarily, um, it was essentially people not taking care of themselves. I mean, it was a hot summer. People weren't hydrating. Uh, people weren't eating. Um, people weren't wearing proper footwear. Um, so I would say it was, by and large, very, nothing sort of like medical emergencies. It was very, you know, like, like I said, people not taking care of themselves. So like I said, providing water, providing um, food, um, potentially bandaging, sprained joints like ankles, things like that. You mentioned earlier that you felt sort of an ethical obligation not to pick and choose your the people you would treat. Um, did you treat anyone who needed it, no matter what their political beliefs were or what side they were on? Yes, absolutely. I want to move to the night of August 25th, 2020. On that particular evening, did you come here to Kenosha? I did. Had you been working at your normal job that day? I was. And do you recall approximately what time you left uh, to come down to Kenosha? 7 p.m. 
Did you travel alone? I did. Were you part of any sort of larger group or organization that was coming to Kenosha that night? I was not. Why did you personally decide to come down here that night? Essentially for the same reasons that I stated earlier. Um, we were all aware of what was happening in the days following Jacob Blake's shooting. Um, people do have a right to demonstrate. Um, I'm no way advocating for property damage or anything like that. But given the, I think we all can agree, chaotic situation of those three days following Jacob Blake's shooting, um, <coughs> there was certainly a, a propensity for violence. Um, or maybe not just violence, but injuries at, at, in general. Um, and so for the same reasons that I stated earlier, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've delivered patients to uh, Freighter down here. I, I'm familiar with the area, and um, I felt that given my level of experience and knowledge that I could be of assistance to people. When you came down here that night, did you bring any of your own medical supplies? I did. What kind of supplies did you bring with you? Um, brought a tourniquet, um, what's called hemostatic gauze, also commonly called quick clot, um, chest wound seals, um, some gloves, some saline spray. How were you dressed that evening? I had a um, black shirt. Um, with a uh, Wu-Tang sign on it, it's a, a pretty famous uh, group. Um, I had khaki shorts, I had tennis shoes, and also I had a blue hat um, with large lettering that said paramedic on the, uh, I guess on the front of it. Were you carrying any of your equipment with you? I was. How were you doing that? I had it in um, a, a small backpack. Were you armed? I was. Tell us about that. I believe in the Second Amendment. I am, I am for uh, people's right to, to carry and bear arms. Um, and that night was no different than any other day. Um, it's keys, phone, wallet, gun. Did you have a permit to carry a concealed weapon? I did. Was it in effect? on August 25th, 2020? It was not. Had it expired? It had. And you had not renewed it? I had not. When you were having this medical truck in Milwaukee, did you carry a gun then? I did. When you came down here, how did you carry your gun? I had my handgun um, holstered in the small of my back. What type of gun was it? It was a Gen 4 Glock 27. So it is a smaller framed 40 caliber handgun. Was it loaded? It was. Do you recall if there was a round in the chamber? That night, I don't. When you came down here to Kenosha that night with your equipment, etc., did you specifically seek to meet out with any particular person or any group or anything along those lines? No, I did not. So tell us what you did when you first came down here. So after I arrived in Kenosha, um, I parked uh, several blocks away. Um, this is both for safety and protection of my property. Um, I put on my equipment, which is essentially my handgun and my medical supplies. Um, and then I walked towards the courthouse. Um, from there, um, things were already, there was already confrontation between demonstrators and the police. Um, and by confrontation, I mean people were throwing water bottles, the police were uh, shooting pepper balls from the top of the courthouse, that, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then after I arrived, um, I, I assessed the scene, um, and almost immediately I came upon a person who had been somehow, whether it was direct spray or, uh, you know, in a, in a gas formation on their form, um, who was affected by the pepper spray. Um, so immediately following that, I started treating this person. Um, and then again from there, I, I, I was assessing the situation, um, primarily treating people who were affected by the tear gas, 
also delegating to other people how to effectively treat that. Um, now, when you say you were delegating, were these people that you knew that, that you were delegating responsibility to? No. So tell us about the delegating process. One instance that I can think of uh, in particular, um, the proper way to treat, well, just to irrigate an eye in general, regardless of what is what is causing you know an issue, um, is you want to start from the nose and then pour out. The idea behind that is that you know if you have something that's affecting this eye, you pour it this way, then it, that chemical or whatever it is irritant can then go into the unaffected eye or unaffected eye. <clears throat> so I had. Um, come across a person who was not properly irrigating the eye, and so that would, would have been one of the forms of, of delegation, just telling this person, hey, you know, this is the proper way to do it, you know, whether or not um, they chose to listen to me, that's, that's their choice, but again, just trying to provide some, some proper knowledge and treatment. Do you recall approximately how many people you uh, gave medical assistance to that night? I don't know the exact number, um, but if you wanted me to estimate, I'd say around 10. Uh, what was the most serious situation that you dealt with? Apart from myself? Yes, as, as a medic treating the, the other folks that were out there. Um, there was an individual, um, a younger patient, who had been shot in the uh, crease of her left arm um, with what we presumed to be a rubber bullet, um, fired from one of the police, and <clears throat> she had sustained a pretty pretty decent laceration, I mean, there was a pretty good cut from it, so whatever had hit her had some force behind it. Um, so while actually treating a patient with tear gas irritant, and then started to hear this young patient scream, and that Im immediately got my attention. Um, and would, would you like me to explain that interaction? You know what, let's pause there for a second. I want to show the jury something. Mr. Grosskreutz, I'm going to play an uh, excerpt of exhibit number 55, and I would like you to, um, uh, when we're done, I'll ask you a couple questions about it, okay? Go ahead. <coughs> the video there for a second. Do you see yourself in that video? I do. Can you help us un uh, identify yourself there? Uh, I would be, uh, you can see the top of my head um, with a blue baseball cap and some white lettering uh, and a black shirt. That is me. Okay. Go ahead. what was shown in that video? Uh, this is me, uh, several, several other individuals uh, who I did not know. Um, the patient laying on the ground and um, what I later found out after um, I had treated the patient, uh, their father. Okay. And was this the individual you mentioned who had a, a laceration to their elbow from a rubber bullet? 
That is correct. Do you remember where physically you were when you were providing that treatment? Um, this would have been the just across the street of the south uh, east corner of Civic Park. Okay, so basically right out across the square here. Correct. And this was on the night of August 25th? Correct. Okay. Can we go show exhibit 56, please? Mr. Grosskreutz, do you recognize what's up on the screen there is exhibit number 56? I do. Can you identify that for us, please? <coughs> um, it appears to be a news article from the Kenosha News um, depicting myself and the patient uh, in a still of the video that we just previously watched. Your Honor, I would move exhibits 55 and 56 into evidence. Objection. While you were out there on the night of August 25th, were you also taking your own video recording of what was going on? I was. Can you tell us about that, please? I can. Um, so essentially when there wasn't a, an, a medical emergency or somebody seeking assistance, um, I am a uh, ACLU legal observer, and I decided that the next best thing that I could do that night um, was just simply record. Was this something where you were just recording it onto your own equipment, or was it being shared in any way? It was being recorded from my cell phone, but it was through a Facebook live stream. Were you broadcasting live on Facebook while you were doing that? I was. And so that video would have recorded most of the things that you saw and, and places that you went uh, while you were here that evening. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Did there come a time in which you encountered a group of folks uh, that were armed in front of the 59th Street car source location? I did. Can you tell us about that? After the police had moved the demonstrators from the park, uh, they started to form um, a, a line, which they would then advance, moving the demonstrators south down Sheridan Road. So I'd say maybe 10, 15 minutes after they, they started clearing the park out, I uh, found myself outside of the 59th Street car source. Um, as I walked up, um, one of the first things I had noticed that there were people um, armed with long guns, um, AR-15 type weapons, uh, similar to the defendants, and they had been on the roof, uh, I recall like three of them, I think, and um, there were also individuals on the ground, similarly dressed, similarly armed. On the ground I recalled four, seeing initially. Um, yeah. Do you remember the first time that you observed the defendant that evening? I do. Can you tell us about that? There was an individual um, who I had assumed came from the demonstration. The reason I assumed that is because this person was coming from north, traveling southbound. Um, this individual is being supported uh, by two other individuals, kind of like that, uh, if you were to hurt your leg and you needed somebody to, to help you. Um, I had observed this uh, individual um, come closer to the car source as the defendant had been essentially offering medical aid. Um, and then that was the, the first time that uh, I saw the defendant. Do you know what happened with regard to that person who was being supported by other people and the defendant? I only know what I had seen in the moment. I don't know what happened to this person afterwards, but what I observed um, was the defendant offering medical assistance and then this individual being um, 
carried in a way onto the car source property. I then heard somebody yell, don't let them treat you. And I turned around, um, and I don't remember why exactly I turned around, but then moments later I then turned back facing towards the car source and towards the defendant and towards that individual, and then that individual along with the other two people supporting them were exiting the property. Did you see the defendant provide any treatment to that individual? I did not. Do you remember a time when you were at that location, that car source location, and you, you observed a dumpster out in the middle of the road? I do recall that, yes. What do you remember about that? Um, I didn't see how it got there, but it, it was your pretty typical municipal dumpster, um, you know, green with the, with the black top. Um, I didn't see anybody actively pushing it. Like I said, I, I didn't even see how it got there. Um, but I, it was probably about a dumpster's length from the, the, the curb, uh, which would be in front of car source. Did you see anyone trying to start it on fire? I did not. Can we please uh, bring up the live stream exhibit number 57? at the 5544 mark please Mr. Grosskreutz, is that part of the live stream that you recorded that evening? That is. And I noticed there seems to be a little bit of a, a lag in the in the audio to the video. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Okay. But is that a true and correct copy of what you recorded that night? Apart from the one or two second delay, it is. So this incident here with the dumpster and whatnot, um, were you physically there, right there, a few feet away when all this was going on? I was. And did you observe the people that were around you at that time? I did. On that particular evening, and I, again, I'm going to ask you to try and go back and put yourself in the mindset of that night. When you're out there on the streets that evening, had you ever heard of anyone by the name of Joseph Rosenbaum? No. Had you ever met that person before? Never. Do you recall seeing Joseph Rosenbaum at any point that evening? I do not. In particular, right around the time of this dumpster fire um, in front of 59th Street Car Source, do you recall seeing him around that at any point? I do not. Do you recall hearing anyone make any threats to any of the people at the car source location that if I get you alone, I'm going to kill you or anything along those lines? I do not. Do you recall hearing anyone make any threats to any of those people at that car source location? I do not. You mentioned that the first time you saw the defendant was this person that was limping, being supported by other people. Um, and I know you mentioned that eventually you saw that person walking away. Uh, do you remember any other observations that you made of the defendant when you were at the 59th Street car source? Uh, I do. Can you tell us about that? Um, I took note, like I said, there were four people 
essentially in, in front of me that I could see. So I took note of what they were wearing, how they were armed. Um, like I said, they were all similarly armed with a de uh, similar weapon of, from that the defendant used. Um, uh, some of them, uh, especially as you can see in the video, um, had uh, body armor, chest rigs, um, and then uh, I, I, I noted that the defendant was wearing a baseball cap, green shirt, jeans, um, and then also a rifle. At that moment in time, did you have any idea who he was? No. Never met him before? Never. Were there times in which you saw him wearing gloves on his hands? I did. When was that? Um, I recall this being right around this time um, that I noticed the defendant also wearing uh, blue latex gloves, or maybe dark purple latex gloves that are pretty common, I mean, very common <laughs> in a healthcare setting. Did that strike you as unusual? In the moment, no, it did not. Do you wear gloves like that when you treat people? I do. Tell us about the process of putting them on and taking them off. Um, yeah. So <coughs> the, these gloves are common throughout all healthcare systems. They're, they're nitrile, um, or they can be latex or non-latex. Um, uh, these gloves are designed to uh, essentially stop anything wet that you don't want on your hands, so like blood or any sort of bodily fluids. The idea is um, it's called body substance isolation. Um, so despite it being a very thin piece of plastic, it's very good at keeping contagions um, off of your hands. So the idea is, um, and also keeping in mind too, that you want to have your hands clean when you're also touching somebody else. Um, especially if there's any sort of open wound, um, you want to minimize that potential for contamination or cross-contamination. The idea is that when you come upon a patient, um, obviously if you're able to, wash your hands, some sort of sanitizer, uh, you know, sanitizer, something along those lines. Um, and then prior to uh, administering aid or treatment to a patient, and then put these gloves on. Um, and then after treating your patient, there is a, a specific way to uh, remove your gloves that, uh, let's say if there was some sort of fluid um, or contagion on the gloves, there's a proper way to remove them to where you wouldn't get your hands dirty afterwards with whatever it might be on the glove. So when you're working as an EMT or a paramedic, do you typically keep one set of gloves on your hands constantly throughout your shift? Never. Why not? Um, essentially for the, the reasons that I just stated. I mean, if you treat... Sorry, essentially what? Uh, essentially for uh, the reasons that I just previously stated. Um, if you, if you um, treat one patient um, and in, on an ambulance shift, on a 24-hour shift, 48-hour shift, you about, you know, one call every hour and a half. That's a lot of patients that you can see. Doesn't, I mean, that doesn't make sense. That's just not one proper hygiene too, it's not proper protocol. It would do be detrimental to your health, every subsequent patient's health, um, and not only from touching or having contact with the patient themselves, but also everything else that you touch. Um, we all know with COVID how easily things can spread. Um, you're touching doorknobs, your face, pens, pencils, equipment, etc. On this particular evening, after you were at the 59th car Street Car Source, do you recall where you went after that? I do. So from the Car Source location here, I um, started walking southbound down Sheridan. Did you wind up at the ultimate gas station at the intersection of 60th and Sheridan? I did. Do you recall what, if anything, you did there? Nothing different than I had previously been doing. So like I explained, when there was no patient essentially to treat, then I started recording. Again, I'm an ACLU legal observer. I thought that was the best way that night that I could provide um, another aspect or another perspective of um, an unbiased account. Um, I mean, video doesn't lie. Um, yes. So when you were 
leaving 59th Street, heading down to the Ultimate Gas Station, were you still wearing your hat with paramedic written on it? I was. Did you have anyone come up to you at that particular time and request any sort of medical assistance? No, nobody did. <coughs> did there come a time in which you heard uh, gunshots? Yes. Can you tell us about that? I was uh, slightly south of uh, Ultimate Gas Station. Um, to be very specific, I think it's Ray's Barbershop, which is either the adjacent building or one there over. Um, while I was recording, um, and I had heard a uh, series of gunshots, um, what I determined to be a few blocks south of where I was. What, if anything, did you do? Um, I first sat and listened, and then had, um, there were people watching my live stream, so I had been narrating essentially what I was seeing, what I was hearing. Um, I'd heard these gunshots, um, and had commented on them, and then after seeing and hearing people running, well, I should say seeing people running northbound and then hearing people yelling medic, I started running southbound towards uh, what I uh, presumed at the time to be the, the origin of the, of the gunshots. Do you recall how far south you ran? There's a map up on the wall behind you if that's helpful. Oh. From my location, I couldn't have gotten more than a block. Um, so I, uh, in, in reference to this map, um, when I first heard the gunshots, I would have been right about here. And then I traveled southbound and then uh, never made it any more south than about here. The first place, just for the record, I'm going to try and uh, put, the, put that in words. Actually, sorry. Go ahead. Correction. I started here and I never made it more south than about here. Okay. So you indicate you started at, I think it's uh, labeled on the map there on the east side of Sheridan as Boost, Mobile, and Check and Go. Is Correct. that right? Correct. And you indicate there's a raised barber shop there also? I believe so, yes. And then from there you ran south past 61st Street and you indicated you were somewhere in the middle of uh, the block between 61st and 62nd. Would that be accurate? That's accurate. And what happened when you got down to that location? I had observed uh, people running northbound um, up Sheridan, and again, hearing people yelling for a medic. But then also, I started to hear people yelling that somebody had been shot. So then that confirmed my, my assumption that somebody did, in fact, get shot. Um, it was there that uh, while I was live streaming, I, um, I met or I had contact with, with the defendant. Can we please play exhibit uh, 57, the limes, live stream, um, starting at the one hour, 17 minute and 10 second mark? Gunshots. It sounds like multiple gunshots. People are scattering. Now this is southbound on Sheridan. This is. I was just at 60th. Looks like they even set up a recliner. Oh, 110 percent, bro. Yeah, dude. 100.
Shad. Pause there for a moment, Mr. Grosskreutz. This is the video you recorded, correct? Correct. And uh, you have told us that you started running from a little bit south of 60th, that gas station, um, down South Sheridan. Is that right? That is right. Were you recording with your phone? I was. Were you holding your phone in your hand while you were running? I was. Okay. Please continue. Why are you shooting? Hey! Hey, what are you doing? You shot somebody? Who shot? Who shot? Can you identify that individual on the screen? That is the defendant. Can we rewind 10 seconds and play that again, please? Hey, what are you doing? You shot somebody? Who shot? Can you tell us, I'm going to ask you two separate questions. First of all, going back into that moment, that interaction you just had with the defendant, what did you think at the time he said to you? At the time, I thought that he, the defendant, had said, I'm working with the police. I didn't do anything. Now that you've had a chance to review the video, do you know what he actually says? Yes. What is that? After watching the video, he said, I'm going to the police. And did he say anything else? I didn't do anything, is what I make out from. Uh, it, it's hard to hear from the, the muffling, but that's what I make out of it. I want you to try and put yourself back in the frame of that evening when you heard him say something to the effect of, was it, I'm working with the police? Is that right? Correct. What was your reaction to that? I found it odd. And um, very noteworthy. Um, previously in the night, uh, an individual I had recorded, uh, Mr. Balch, um, had described some sort of plan with the police that they were going to um, essentially push demonstrators south down Sheridan and then past the, past the car source lot and then from there we're going to uh, essentially retreat or, or back up that line and Mr. Balch had explained um, that there was some sort of understanding, some sort of plan to whatever extent that is, but that the police were going to push protesters down past the car source, and he said that then uh, the police told him that it was up to the militia members, as they refer to themselves, uh, to deal with them. When you heard the defendant say what you thought was, I'm working with the police, did that bring back that other knowledge, what Mr. Balch had said? Yes. Can we play the video forward just a few more seconds and then I'm going to pause again? Who shot? Hey, stop him! Hey, stop him! It appears to me, Mr. Grosskreutz, that you ran along or jogged along the defendant for a moment when you had that little interaction. Is that fair to say? That is. And then it looks like you kind of let him continue and you turn back south again. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. Why did you do that? So you hear me ask the question, who's shot? Who is shot? Um, at that moment, the only thing I was concerned about was finding this person who had been shot or presumably had been shot, um, given that I was still north of where I thought the shots had come from. Instinctually, I turned, you know, did a 180 facing northbound, then turned southbound because I was concerned for whoever might be potentially injured. It appears from the video, though, that you don't go very far 
before you turn and head back after the defendant. Would that be fair to say? That is fair to say. What changed? I'd seen a, a number of people um, running um, northbound um, in the same direction as the defendant. Um, I'd started hearing people saying, he just shot that guy, he just shot somebody. Um, so, yeah. so then you turn around and head back north after the defendant? I wouldn't say after the defendant. Um, Why did you turn around and head back north after you heard these people say these things? With what Mr. Balch had said previously, um, the, essentially the way that these um, self-proclaimed militia members were conducting themselves, the gunshots, uh, people yelling for a medic, my interaction with the defendant, or yeah, my interaction with the defendant, um, and the, really the lack of information that I had gotten from him, and specifically what I had thought I had heard, then coupled with this group of people um, running northbound, um, I had uh, essentially made an inference or an assumption that um, there could be a potential for somebody getting injured. Um, and any time you bring a firearm into that equation, the stakes are, are much higher um, for both serious injury and, and, and death. Based on all the factors that you just outlined for us, did you feel like your services might, as a medic might be more needed in the direction the defendant was headed? Correct. What did you do after that? After I had turned around and started running in the same direction as the defendant, uh, again, this, this, I wouldn't say that there was more people joining, but I, more people were then pointing out the defendant, saying that he had just shot somebody, uh, that he's trying to get away, get him, things of, of that nature. And then so again, further inferencing from the things that I heard and experienced, witnessed earlier in the night, I thought that the defendant was um, an active shooter. And like I had mentioned earlier, any time you add a firearm into the equation, or it, it, like I said, the, the stakes are so much higher um, for somebody potentially being seriously injured um, or being, being killed. Can we please um, pull up exhibit number five? Exhibit five. This is the BG on the scene video. Let's go ahead and play that. I'll be pausing here in a, in a little bit. <laughs> just saw you come running into the screen from the right. You're just behind that figure in the white shirt. Um, before this moment, had you drawn your firearm? No. Where was it? Um, like I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I, I keep my pistol uh, holstered uh, in the small of my back. But don't you have it in your hand at this point? I can't see. Uh, okay. Can't see from this video. Did there come a time when you were running that you did pull your gun out? Yes. Why? Again, in the moment, uh, I, I, I thought that the defendant was an active shooter. Having been not too far behind, like you had mentioned, and just about to come into the, the frame here. Um, I had uh, heard several more gunshots. 
Um, and again, making inferences, the defendant was the only one with a large caliber rifle. Um, I'd seen an individual um, jump over the defendant, and then the defendant heard two shots, and then from there I, I saw another individual um, use his skateboard to hit the defendant, um, or hold the defendant. Either way, the individual had made contact with the defendant with his skateboard, and then from there I heard another shot, and then as you can see in this still, an individual, well, yeah, okay. I want to back up for a second, Mr. Grosskreutz, because we have other video that shows you pulling your gun out before those shots are fired. Um, so you, do you remember specifically, were you intending when you pulled your gun out, were you intending to use it? If I had to. Um, I, I didn't draw my firearm with a express intent of, of using it, but also being ready if I had to use it. Let's uh, continue the video for a little bit and I'm going to pause here. Let's pause right there. Uh, we've already seen this video. There's an individual on the left uh, who is, uh, had been shot at twice by the defendant. Then the defendant is there on the ground and there's another individual uh, between uh, the defendant and you, uh, Anthony Huber, who has been shot in the chest at this point. Uh, and that individual uh, to the right of Mr. Huber that's sort of crouched over, that's you, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you witness the defendant fire two shots at that man on the left? I did. Did you witness him fire a shot into Mr. Huber's chest? I did. So when you come upon the defendant at this point, do you recall what you were holding in your hands? I do. What, what were you holding? In my right hand, I had my Glock pistol, and in my left hand, I had my uh, cell phone. What was going through your mind at this particular moment? That I was going to die. Let's continue the video for just a second, please. Pause. There's a time in this video when you appear to hold your hands up. Do you know about that? Do you recall that? I do. Why did you do that? <coughs> After Anthony Huber was shot, um, you can see in the video I'm not too far behind him. Um, and the defendant had, after murdering Anthony Huber... No uh, the objection is sustained. That whether uh, the death of Anthony Huber was caused by murder or not is for you jurors to decide and not for the witness. So please uh, keep that in mind. That uh, and people, when they're in the court and they're testifying, uh, they can be affected by their emotions, sometimes by their jobs. And uh, and they will, for a, someone who comes into a physician, for example, with a gunshot wound, may be identified as a victim. And uh, that's the language that they speak in the hospital because the person comes in with a gunshot wound. Here in the court, where the issue is yet to be determined whether someone's a victim or not, and it's to be based on the evidence presented in court, and it's a decision to be made by you jurors, not by a witness, not by the judge, not by the prosecutor or the defense attorney. So uh, uh, I'm going to ask you to strike the comment, which was this witness's view of the subject, and uh, because it carries no weight. it's for you folks to decide. Any question about that? Okay, thanks. Go ahead. So you had just seen Mr. Huber get shot. Correct. And so what was going on in your mind? Uh, I was <laughs> very close to the defendant, um, and I, I, I thought there was a high likelihood that I, I would be shot myself. Can we back up and play 10 seconds? Uh, go back 10 seconds, please. 
Please continue. At this point in the video, is the defendant pointing his AR-15 at you? Yes, he is. And you have your hands raised in the air at this point? I do. Continue the video, please. Pause. Did you see the defendant do anything with his gun after you put your hands up? I did. What did you see him do? Um, it's a uh, an action that's uh, typically referred to as uh, re-racking um, uh, a firearm. Um, it's after the defendant had pointed his rifle at me and put my hands up, and then the defendant, um, like I said, did this motion. It's called re-racking, and that's Essentially, where you take the the, the slide, uh, which on a Air 15 like that would be on the top, and you pull back, and pull back, and what that does is, depending on if there was already a <coughs> already a, uh, a bullet or a round in the chamber, which would mean it would, would be ready to fire, as you can put in a magazine, uh, which where the bullets are held, and the firearm won't be able to fire, but as soon as you then pull the slide back, like on a pistol or on an AR-15 on the top, that then either loads the rifle or the firearm for it to be ready to fire, or if there was already a round previously in the chamber, that then ejects that round or casing, if that round had been spent, um, and then reloads the next bullet into the chamber or the barrel. So after you raised your hands like this, you saw the defendant re-rack the weapon? Correct. What did you think was going to happen? In my experiences and in my inference uh, in that moment, after the defendant had pointed his weapon at me and I had put my hands in the air, re-racking the weapon in my mind meant that the defendant pulled the trigger while my hands were in the air but the gun didn't fire so then by re-racking the weapon I inferred that the defendant wasn't accepting my surrender did you feel that he was going to point the gun and shoot at you again yes what did you do then? So after the defendant had re-racked his weapon with the rifle still aimed at me, in that moment, I felt that I, I had to do something to try and prevent myself from being being killed or being shot or, or killed. Um, and so I decided that the best course of action would be to close the distance between the defendant and I, and then um, you know, from there I'd, I I don't know. I mean, if it meant trying what Anthony had just tried, wrestling the gun, de detaining the defendants, I I, I I don't know, because uh, I never had an opportunity. Um, I do know, though, I was never trying to kill the defendant. That was never, never something that I was trying to do. In that moment, I was trying to preserve my own life. But doing so while also taking the life of another is not something that I'm capable or comfortable in doing uh, that goes against almost a lifelong ethical code that I've lived by in, 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 regards, to, in regards to medicine. Can we back the video up 10 seconds, please? Can we back it up 10 seconds, please? 
Go ahead. Mr. Grosskreutz, after seeing the defendant shoot at one person at close range twice, shoot at Mr. Huber in the chest once, and having already been told by others in the crowd that he'd previously already shot someone else, and having him point the gun at you, and you're holding your own pistol in your hand, Why didn't you take your own gun and shoot the defendant first? Like I said, that's not the kind of person that I am. That's not why I was out there. That's not why I was out there for 75 days prior to that. Why I spent up until that point <laughs> spent my time, my money, my education providing care for people. That's not it's not who I am. And definitely not somebody that I would want to become. And in that moment I thought it, it would I tried to attempt a a, a, a not lead the way to and that interaction. When the defendant shot you, where were you hit? I was hit in my right bicep. <coughs> what kind of damage did that do? Um, I effectively lost a, a large majority of my right bicep. Can we please play Exhibit 58? do this, I do want to let everyone know that this is going to be a very graphic. Uh, exhibit, um, what does Exhibit 58 show? Uh, myself, after um, being shot by the defendant. Are you still holding your Glock in this picture? I am. Had you fired your Glock at all that night? at any point? No. Can we please show exhibit number Describe what this picture shows, Mr. Grosskreutz. This is me probably 30 seconds after I was shot by the defendant. Uh, you see who I believe to be Mr. Lukowski on the right of the screen, uh, me in the center with the blue paramedic hat. Right above my hat is Mr. Balch, I believe. And then to the left of me, uh, unfortunately, I don't know who the two individuals uh, who you can't see their faces are, but then um, that is a uh, person I came to know as uh, CJ Halliburton, who was also live streaming that night, and him, myself, and uh, Mr. Lukowski are, um, Mr. Halliburton is applying uh, a tourniquet to my right bicep ball, uh, Mr. Lukowski and myself are um, 
trying to instruct Mr. Halliburton on the use and application of the tourniquet. Can we please play Exhibit 60? Exhibits 58, 59, and 60 into evidence. Objection. Received. Would this be a good time for a break, Your Honor? It is. Uh, Please don't talk about the case during the break. Read, watch, and listen to any of the account of the trial. Uh, we'll see you in a little bit.
You may continue. We need the jury. Oh, what is it today? What is it today? Can I just ask real quick, Judge, before we bring them down? Um, do you have any idea what our lunch period is going to look like? Uh, it's warm food, so it's going to be whenever it arrives. Okay. It's supposed to come at around noon, but the two times we've had warm food before, they've all come quite early. So let's hope for the best. Could, we, could I ask, Your Honor, could we have a 12 to 1 break today? That there's some additional issues that I made you aware of earlier that may require some extra time. I will, as much as I can, I will accommodate that. But as I say, if the food comes warm, I'm not going to make the jurors wait um, for more than 10 or 15 minutes max. Okay. Just so you know. Till one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Would yeah. you come down, please? Yep. Mr. Grosskreutz, the last video we watched uh, had some uh, police individuals with their armored vehicles uh, and they appeared to be uh, escorting you away. Would that be fair to say? That is fair to say, yes. What happened after that? Um, after uh, the police officers that uh, uh, responded in the Bearcat or that armored personnel carrier, um, they assisted me getting into the back of it, um, the inside. Um, from what I remember, it's designed. There's two benches on either side with a pretty narrow walkway. Um, from here, uh, I had officers on either side of me. Uh, I had been seated on the floor in between the two bench seats. And then from there, I remember um, having a conversation with um, what I'm going to assume was the medic on that. Uh, I don't know if that was a SWAT team or what the organization of that unit was, but uh, it appeared to me that whoever I was having this interaction with, this conversation with, was the medic, for lack of a more specific term. Um, from there, um, from what I remember, um, this SWAT medic um, was attempting to start an IV on me. Um, we then had a conversation regarding whether or not, uh, well, let me back that up. Um, while this medic was trying to start an IV on me, I had begun asking him to apply another tourniquet because my arm was still bleeding. So as far as uh, medical practices can go, if the whatever wound is still bleeding with a single tourniquet, the idea is you want this thing to be very, very tight to stop all blood flow. The idea is um, life over limb. But you can apply another tourniquet or an additional one uh, <coughs> to assist um, in, in stopping the bleeding. Um, and then from there, um, we arrived at the hospital, and the uh, SWAT members, the police officers, opened the back of the door or the back of the back door of the Bearcat, um, 
a few of them got out first and essentially provided a perimeter. Um, and then another one or two officers um, helped me get up from, um, so I should clarify, I was sitting down in between uh, the two benches. One officer had helped me up. And then from there, I, um, I walked myself into the emergency room. Um, when you say you were at the hospital, is that KMH uh, Freighted South down here on uh, just off of Sheridan? That is correct, yes. And what sort of medical treatment did you receive either, either at that hospital or at, at subsequent facilities? Um, <clears throat> upon uh, arriving at the first uh, hospital in the emergency room, um, the tourniquets were left in place. And once you put those on, you want to be very sure before you take them off. There's issues with blood clots and that sort of thing. Um, from there, uh, I remember uh, having my vitals taken. So that includes like pulse, um, blood pressure, um, EKGs, which is uh, heart rhythms, um, the pretty general stuff when anybody goes to the hospital. But then specific to um, my injury, um, they, they being the hospital staff, the ER doctor, um, who had been working that shift, um, determined that they were not able to provide adequate treatment for me. So for a little bit of clarification, um, hospitals, at least at least in Wisconsin, are uh, on a tier system. Uh, why don't you ask another question? Sure. So at the first hospital, KMH, uh, they determined they needed you to send you someplace else. Is that fair to say? Yes. Where did you go from there? Um, I don't recall the name of the hospital. Um, I do know that I was transported by ambulance to um, an additional hospital. I remember the ambulance ride only being uh, about five minutes. Um, and then at that hospital, did they treat you or did you have to go someplace else after that? Originally, I was supposed to be treated at that hospital, but given the severity of my injury, um, it was determined that I was going to be uh, transported by Flight for Life to uh, Freighter uh, in Milwaukee. And once you got up to, uh, to Freighter in Milwaukee, uh, did you have to go undergo any surgical procedures or anything? I did. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, when I first arrived uh, to Freighter in Milwaukee, uh, I was brought into the trauma room. Um, Essentially, from there, I uh, I was stripped naked, getting prepped for surgery, um, and that surgery, from my understanding, is uh, the, the first one uh, is what's called a debridement. Um, essentially, what that is is a, it's a, a very deep cleaning of a of a wound um, to stave off infection. Essentially, it's scraping away the dead tissue. Now, we've heard other testimony that the your, when you were shot, it was shortly before midnight on August 25th. Um, were you eventually taken up to Freight at Milwaukee sometime overnight? In the early morning, yes. And the surgery, would that have occurred shortly after you got to that hospital? Almost immediately, was, uh, almost immediately after me getting there, yes. Do you recall if there were any other surgical procedures done on you while you were at uh, Freighter that early morning? Um, the early morning, I don't believe um, I had any surgeries. Um, I was in the, uh, the ICU, um, uh, a few a few rooms over from Jacob Blake, and uh, that, like I said, it's an intensive care unit, so it's for serious traumatic injuries or um, medical uh, ailments. Uh, but then from there, I was moved to. Um, would essentially be a, a, a tier down from that, so it's like the long-term ICU, if that makes sense. Um, and then from there, I had, um, I don't recall if it was two or three, but I, I do know I had at least two more of these uh, debridement surgeries. Um, again, that sort of cleans off the tissue. Um, was there eventually uh, surgical procedures done to try and repair the damage to your arm? Yes. When was that? That would have been the Monday, follow, the, the following Monday. Okay. And have you undergone more than one of those types of procedures? 
That specific procedure, no. Okay. Overall, how much treatment have you received since this shooting to try and repair the damage? Uh, I would say about a, a week in the hospital for emergency care. Um, and then from there, uh, several months of, of physical therapy. Um, now, when you got to the hospital, one of the hospitals, you said they, they took everything off of you. Did you have anything with you that you had uh, picked up on the street while you were out uh, around that night? Yes, I did. What did you have? Um, I had a uh, spent tear gas canister. I have an exhibit here which has been marked as exhibit number 61, I believe. Is that what the sticker says on there? Okay. Um, I'm going to have Detective Antaramian remove this item and hold it up for the jury. Mr. Grosskreutz, is the detective holding up the item that you're referring to? Yes, he is. I would move Exhibit 61 into evidence. Objection? No. Steve. Where did you find that? That would have been maybe 50 feet south on Sheridan from car source. From that 59th Street or car I'm, source? I'm sorry. Yes, 59th Street car source. Okay. And you said it was spent, meaning whatever originally was there, all the gas had come out. Correct. Is that right? So it's, it wasn't capable of doing any further damage or harm to anyone. Correct. Why did you pick it up? I don't know. Um, I, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. So did there come a time in which law enforcement officers came to speak to you at the hospital? That's correct. Did they ask you to sign a release for them to obtain your medical records? They did. And did you, in fact, do so? I did. Did you also provide the um, officers with a uh, statement about what had happened to you? Yes, I did. And did you describe to them the fact that you had been recording uh, the night's events on a Facebook live stream? Yes, I did. When you say a Facebook live stream, is that something that if someone's on Facebook, they could possibly see that if they wanted to? That is correct. Did you also have a copy of that video on your phone? No, not a physical copy. Where was the actual file itself in, in the world, if you will? Um, when you record something on Facebook Live, it, it gets stored in your profile videos, photos. Um, so while I didn't have a physical copy of it on my phone, I was able to access the recording via my Facebook through my phone, if that makes sense. Were the police, did you make them aware of the fact that there was that video out there? Yes, I did. Around the time that you were in the hospital that night after the shooting, in the early morning hours, etc., cetera, um, did you become concerned about your own personal safety? Yes, I did. Can you tell us about that? After, <clears throat> after the events of August 25th, um, it was made known to me pretty quickly that uh, people online um, and in person um, were... It sure sounds like it. It goes to his state of mind, Your Honor. Uh, there's My state of mind about what? Cooperating. Um... This is intimidation. 
See, the rule is you can't buttress credibility unless it's attacked. It has been with the detective's testimony, Your Honor. There's been questioning over his cooperation level already. Um, I'm going to overrule the objection and, and allow the evidence. But and we're working again with the hearsay rule. Um, so I'm not going to permit the evidence to be considered as proof of what he may have seen or heard about what was on the internet, um, but rather as proof of circumstances operating on his mind. Does that make sense? So it isn't to be taken as true. Uh, if let's, for example, I'm, I'm gathering you're going to suggest there was some suggestion of harm, potential harm. It's not being offered to prove that there was, in fact, a true risk from any particular source of any harm, but rather um, what he concluded based upon the information that he heard. Make sense? Okay. Thank you. Please continue telling us about um, your concerns for your safety. Um, so, like I had just said, um, it had be made aware to me that uh, people online were making threats, um, going above just personal opinion, um, as well as um, people coming outside my place of residence, family members, including my mother, my grandmother, an aunt that I had hardly talked to. Um, and that became, that, that became very concerning for me. Uh, Did there come a time in which the investigating officers asked you for access to everything on your cell phone? Through my attorney, yes, I did. Was that something that you were interested in turning over to law enforcement? At the time, I was I, I was under the impression that I was fully cooperating, and so yes, uh, that is something that I was willing to do. Did that actually happen? No, that did not. Do you know why not? At the time, no. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't know. Did you personally ever make a decision to refuse to give over all of the contents of your cell phone to law enforcement? Did you personally? I never personally refused that, no. May I approach her? Mr. Grosskreutz, I have put in front of you a document which has been marked as exhibit number 68. Do you recognize that document? I do. Can you tell us what that is? Essentially this document that I'm looking at is an official form um, for uh, informed consent um, to disclose um, evidence, personal, personal property, personal records. Do you know whose form that is? My form. Well, oh, sorry. Which uh, agency or, or, or entity created that form, if you know? It is marked by um, the Kenosha Police Department and the Kenosha County District Attorney. And is this a form that was presented to you by a law enforcement officer so that they could get access to your medical records? Yes. Did you sign that form? Yes, I did. What day did you sign it? August 26th, 2020. I'd move Exhibit 68 into evidence. Objection? No. Received. After everything that you've been through, Mr. Grosskreutz, do you still have any um, physical issues with your arm? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Uh, apart from the um, obvious loss of tissue, uh, muscle doesn't grow back. Um, aside from that, um, and, and 
perhaps things being difficult, and like larger, heavier things being difficult uh, to lift. I do have um, a neurological deficit on my arm. So I would say about here, about here where the injury is. Essentially all of this and through my thumb, through my thumb, I'm not able to feel. Um, I am able to move it, uh, but there is no sensation in that area. And I just want to, for the record, demonstrate you held up your right arm. You indicated that the wound was near the crux of your elbow. Correct. And you indicated that there was no feeling in an area of the arm, which if I'm characterizing this correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it looked like you were describing the top of your forearm running from the elbow down to your right thumb. Would that be fair to say? That is correct. In the area where that wound was, did you have a tattoo? I did. Is that tat I'm sorry, I, I still do. And what does that tattoo say? Um, tattoo uh, is a image of a uh, pretty prominent uh, symbol in uh, the healthcare field. Um, it's the snake wrapped around the cross, or sorry, around the uh, around the staff. Um, on the top, there is a banner that says "Do no harm." Uh, meaning do and o harm. It's a banner on the top here, and then on the bottom, um, there was a um, a banner that said do no harm, k n o w harm. Um, yes. And that's one of the ma mantras of the medical industry: is first do no harm. Correct. One moment, please. All right, uh, cross exam. So, Mr. Grosskreutz, on uh, the tw morning of the 26th of uh, August, do you remember telling uh, the officer who interviewed you, sometime during the incident, my Gen 4 Glock 27 that has a belt clip attached fell off my waist? Do you remember that? I don't recall saying that, no. Exhibit number 69 for identification. Do you recognize that document? I do. Okay. And that's, if I could be fair, I'm not going to stand by you the whole time, so I'm sorry, but um, is that your signature? That is. Okay. And it appears that that is, um, it says on 82520 at 11.30 p.m. at 6300 Sheridan Road, and then it goes on a narrative version of <coughs> your statement. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And if I could, toward the end of that large paragraph, you'd agree it says, sometime during the incident, my Gen 4 Glock 27 that had a belt clip attached fell off my waist. Correct? Correct. Okay. That's a lie, right? I wouldn't say that's a lie, no. You didn't take the Glock out of your back here and run with it? I did. So it didn't fall off your waist, it was in your hand. That's correct. So you would say that's not a lie? No, I, I would say it isn't. Okay, and you told that to multiple officers, isn't that true? I don't know. Same exhibit, sir. The next sentence. I told multiple officers that I dropped my firearm, right? Correct. Okay. Now. 
strap your firearm. You were chasing Mr. Rittenhouse with your gun, right? You yes. Are you were chasing him with your gun? Yes? No. You didn't chase him down Sheridan Road, pulling your gun, chasing after him. That's a lie. You're saying that didn't happen. I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but I wasn't chasing the defendant. You were running after him? No. No. Okay. Did you ever get charged for not telling the truth to the police about dropping your gun? No. Did you ever tell the police in here on this statement that you actually had a firearm in your hand and pointed it at the defendant? No, I did not. You never told him you had a gun at all in terms of as you had an interaction with Mr. Rittenhouse, true? That is correct. And I know you said you don't know, but Jason Lakowski testified that he picked up that firearm that he believes belonged to you, and there was one in the chamber. Do you dispute that that could be true? No, I do not. Now, you had talked about your purpose of being there that evening. You're a member of our Wisconsin Revolution, are you not? No, I'm not. You're a member of the People's Revolution? No, I'm not. Have you spoken at their rallies? I have at one. And during that rally, uh, have you made statements such as, long live the revolution? I have. And you have no affiliation with them, though? Affiliation, yes. Okay, there's some of those people in the crowd today, aren't there? Yes. Now, your first statement to uh, Officer, I think it's Birch, uh, on the morning of uh, the 26th, um, when he's asking you, uh, about what happened. If I have this right, you don't explain at all to him as to how you approached Mr. Rittenhouse with your gun, correct? Mm, can I, am I, able to, I don't know. You don't I don't, know? I don't, I don't remember specifically on that document. Okay. No. In fact, Six hours after you had been shot, you had a lawyer, right? Correct. Okay. And you wanted to stop the interview with the police because you had a lawyer, right? That is correct. And this is a civil lawyer, right? That is one thing that she represents, yes. Okay. And she's in court today, right? Yes, she is. Okay. And I know this wasn't addressed, but you have... Shortly thereafter, I want to say um, in October, I'm going to show you what is Exhibit 63. You have now filed a lawsuit in federal court. Is that right? 
That is correct. Did you read that? Yes, I did. Okay. In that document, you again failed to mention that you possessed a firearm. Is that right? That is correct. So you, in these documents that you are filing with courts, you are leaving out the fact that you had possessed a firearm when this, when you were shot, right? That, that is correct. correct. And this is, so to be fair, uh, this is your testimony today and how this case turns out has a, has an impact on your ability to try to collect your 10 million, right? That is correct. So if he's convicted, if Mr. Rittenhouse is convicted, your chance of getting 10 million bucks is better, right? I'm not entirely sure how that plays out. Haven't had any conversations with your lawyer about well, that? You're not going to ask any yep. conversations with this lawyer. Okay, fair enough. Um, you, you're aware that if Mr. Rittenhouse is convicted, your chances of getting the $10 million are better? I don't have an objection. This has been asked and answered, and I don't think he's got a basis to answer that. Judge, I well, I have sustained on the first ground. I would move 63. Uh, objection? No. Receive. So you um, were asked by uh, Attorney Binger about a live stream that you had been running that evening, right? That is correct. All right. And there are, as far as I can tell, three instances in which you see, at least on that live stream, you see Mr. Rittenhouse. Do you agree with that? Yes, I would. Okay. Do you have them? And during that first contact, which we'll see, you're filming, you had talked a little bit about this, you were filming him. 
I know you said that you heard people say something along the lines of don't go to them. Do you help her out? No, I do not. Okay. Now, later on, 31 minutes. 31.00. Later on, you see him walking. Um, would that be fair? Right? You can play it from right there. So like the Boogaloo boys, the good old boys rolling up. Two right there. Two right there. Speaking? Yeah. That is correct. So you say you can go home, you fucking stooge. Right? Correct. Okay. He didn't do anything to you, did he? No. You didn't, do, you didn't see him threaten anyone, did you? No, I did not. You didn't see him act aggressive toward anyone, did you? No, I did not. In fact, again, whether you agree that he's a medic or not, he's asking people if they need help. Agreed? That is correct. Okay. Then... Mr. Banger had asked you about this one, and this is um, the time that Mr. Rittenhouse is, you, you videotape him. That's fine right there. Go ahead. Hey, hey, your job isn't to be in the streets. You got to stay on your property. That's why you got problems already with people. So you see him pulling a dumpster out of the road, right? Correct. And you'd agree on normal situation, a dumpster's not supposed to be in the road? In normal situations, yes. And you hear somebody telling him, hey, that's not your job. You're not to do that, right? That is correct. He doesn't react to that person at all, does he? No, he does not. He doesn't threaten that person in any way? No, he does not. He doesn't point his firearm at that person? No, he does not. He, for To be fair, he ignores that person, doesn't he? I think that's a fair way of putting it. Okay. And in terms of the the next time you really see him is your contact with him on Sheridan Road after the shooting of Joseph Rosenbaum, right? That is correct. Okay. Now, you were asked, were you armed with a firearm? And you said that you were. One Mr. Banger said, what do you bring? And you said, keys, wallet, whatever else, and a gun, right? I did say that, yeah. Kind of standard operating procedure for you out in the summer of 2020? Uh, not just the summer of 2020. Oh, so you had carried your firearm at times previous to that? That's correct. And you're doing that for personal protection, correct? Correct. And you're carrying it concealed, are you not? That is correct. It's unlawful for you to carry it concealed. Is that not true? Unlawful? Yeah, you can't carry a concealed weapon without a, a CCW permit, right? That is correct, yes. You have to open carry. You have to have, you've been talking about people with their guns out. You have to carry it with it out if you don't have a CCW permit, right? That is correct. And you didn't have a CCW permit, did you? I did have a CCW permit. It wasn't valid, correct? After the fact, yes, I found out that it was not valid. So, have you been charged for unlawfully carrying a firearm? No, I have not. So, you're carrying a gun for protection in your, if I have it right, back here, right? That is correct. And I'm motioning into my kind of my belt area. Correct. Okay. Now, your first contact with Mr. Rittenhouse. I think you had testified that you believed that he said to you, um, 
that he is that he was going to the police or that he was working with the police, right? That is correct. Well, on your statement on the 26th, which is the first statement you gave to law enforcement, right? Correct. You told law enforcement, I heard the guy say, quote, that he pulled the gun on me first, unquote, right? That is correct. So you never say to the police during your interview, he told me he was working with you guys. You never tell him that, do you? That is correct. So when you make contact with Mr. Rittenhouse, tell me if this is fair. And I'm not, Mr. Bingers asked uh, witnesses to do this, so I'm going to ask you to do the same. You've probably watched videos, you've probably seen all this. I'm asking you to put yourself back there at that time, okay? You know shots are fired, right? Correct. Okay. And the only information that you have is Mr. Rittenhouse saying, according to you, he pulled the gun on me first, right? Correct. And based on that, you believe there's an active shooter? Not solely on that, but yes. You don't have any information, correct? I had minimal information. And in fact, what he says to you was, I'm going to the police, correct? That is correct. And he's running toward the police, isn't he? That is correct. Okay. So what you, and tell me if this is right. You have no idea what happened with Mr. Rosenbaum, do you? I, apart from, no. I'm just, no. On that day? Correct. Okay. And he tells you, he's running, and he tells you, I'm, whatever he tells you, I'm going to the police or what you think is, um, he pulled the gun first, and he's running away from you, right? He's running north on Sheridan Road. Yes? Correct. And he's running away from where you're standing. True? Correct. You, at that point, pull a firearm out from your belt and begin to chase him. True? That is not true. I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 35. Can you take a peek at that for a second? That's a picture of you, is that right? On the right-hand side with the blue cap and... Yeah, yeah. you can look there where right. this is you, right? right? Correct. Okay. And you're digging into your waistband in the back, are you not? Yes. That's where your gun is located, is it not? That is correct. Okay. Do you see Kyle Rittenhouse in this picture? I don't think so, no. Okay. So, if we can be fair here, this isn't him, right? No, it is not. And you don't believe that's him? I don't believe so, no. Okay. And you'd agree none of these other people are him either? I think that's a fair thing to say, yes. Okay. What do you think, to the best of your ability, how far that guy's ahead of you? Uh, it'd be hard to tell, but based on what I can see here, maybe 30 feet. Okay. So you believe, based on this, Mr. Rittenhouse is more than 30 feet ahead of you because he's not behind that guy, right? Uh, yes. Okay. So he's 30 feet, at least 30 feet ahead of you. You look like at that point you're moving. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So with him 30 feet ahead of you, running away from you, at that point you pull your firearm and begin to chase him, correct? No. You don't begin to chase him? Nope. No, I do not. You head in the direction that he's running, yes? Correct. But you just happen to be running in that direction? It has nothing to do with Kyle Rittenhouse running in that direction? No, it does have to do with the defendant running in that direction, yes. Okay. So you are trying to chase him down? No. You can hear people yelling at that point, get him, get his ass, things like that, right? 
That is correct, yes. Did you hear, there's one that I've heard on this, and I don't know if you've heard it. Cranium that boy. Did you hear that? I've heard it after the fact. Um, in that moment, uh, I, I do not recall hearing that, no. Okay. But you acknowledge you hear get him and get his ass. Correct, I do. Okay. So, fair at that point, you believe these people are, those people are chasing him down. Yes, I do. And the, I'm going to use the word mob, you use whatever word you want. It's getting bigger as they're running, isn't it? More people are joining this. I think that's a fair thing to say. And you believe, well, tell me if this is true. You were concerned for Kyle Rittenhouse's safety. Yes, I was. You were concerned because you saw, and I'm going to refer to him as the only way we referred to him, jump kick man. So you see this guy kick him in the face. True? I do not see jump kick man kick him in the face. You see him attempt to kick him in the face? From my perspective, I didn't see any specific motion regarding kicking. Um, but it is fair to say that I, I did observe jump kick man going over the defendant. Okay. And he's going, if you remember, he's going over the defendant with his foot in the air, correct? I don't recall that. Do you have a picture of him? <laughs> and before I bring it up, to be fair, you're making up ground on Mr. Rittenhouse, correct? As you're running in his direction. Correct, correct. Okay, you, had, you eventually catch him. Correct. Come up to him, right? Correct. Okay. This photograph, yes. Okay. Well, you, how far away from this when it's going on are you? I don't recall how far away I was exactly when this uh, action occurred. You're a matter of feet, though, right? I think that's a fair thing to say. Uh, okay. Close. All right. And you, you're seeing this, so you are having some concern, maybe as a medic or your all your training, uh, that. Kyle Rittenhouse is in physical danger. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So, and you believe he's in physical danger because he's being attacked, right? That's fair. That's a fair thing to say, yes. Okay. So you see this, then you see, can you bring up the Huber picture, please? Then you see Mr. You didn't know it then, but you know now that's Anthony Huber, right? Correct. Okay. And it, you see, you saw this happening, right? Correct. And it was no more from me to you away probably at that point, true? I don't recall, but I, it's probably fair. Walmart? Yes. Okay. And in fact, you had mentioned to the officers that you even recalled Mr. Huber uh, holding onto the trucks of that skateboard when he was striking you, right? Correct. And that, to be fair, as a medic, that concerned you, did it not? I think any time that there is a, a risk of head trauma, 
that uh, it's a risk. Yeah, no, fair enough. So you believe in this picture, one of the reasons you wanted to intervene was you believe that Mr. Rittenhouse was in danger of being seriously hurt, right? In part, yes. And you had mentioned to the police that evening that you tried telling Mr. Huber, you just said the guy, but you tried telling the guy to stop hitting him with the skateboard. Is that right? That is what I put in my statement, yes. Is that true? With the benefit of hindsight, I don't believe that to be true, no. Okay, so when you told that to the police that you told the guy with the skateboard to stop hitting him, that, that was, that's not correct, that's not true. That is correct. Now, your original statement then to the police was, I tried telling the guy to stop hitting him with the skateboard. The guy on the ground then turned over, racked the weapon, and pointed his gun at me and shot me, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. Um, you omitted the idea, you omitted the fact that you ran up on him and had a Glock pistol in your hand, right? You left that out. Correct. Would you think in a case where you are shot that providing the police information that you were actually possessing a firearm at the time would be relevant? I think that's fair, yes. Okay. But you didn't think it was relevant to tell them that day, correct? It's not that I didn't think it wasn't relevant. Um, after the defendant had shot me, I had just gotten out of surgery when the Kenosha police officers had arrived and just gone through one of the most traumatic experiences in my life, both emotionally and physically. I had just gotten out of surgery. I was, had just been sedated. I was on pain meds. So. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt you. Sorry. Um, it wouldn't have been a purposeful uh, omission. You were asked at that same statement what you did for work and you refused to answer that, right? That is correct. So you made a conscious decision to not answer that. That is correct. You weren't so drugged that you couldn't answer that question, right? I refused because I was worried for my safety. My point is mm -hmm. that you had a thoughtful process not to answer that. That is correct. You told this officer specifically what Mr. Rittenhouse was wearing, correct? That is correct. You had a thoughtful process, even though you just got out of surgery and were drugged and whatever else was going on, which I understand, you were still able to answer all those questions to the best of your ability and they were accurate, right? To the best of my ability, yes. Okay. So the fact that you failed to mention that you possessed a firearm when you were shot and that you dropped it, were those things that you forgot because of your medication? I would say not only the medication, but also uh, the traumatic experience that I had just gone through. And you understand it's the only information that you appeared to have forgotten that puts you with a gun directly in front of him, right? That is correct. Now, you are also then interviewed again by law enforcement in September. Is that right? That is correct. You bring your lawyer. Correct. Mr. Binger's there? Not in person. Okay, but he's present in the... He is attending the meeting, yes. Okay. And there were three... Sorry, he was present uh, via Zoom. Okay, and there were a total, if you remember, three prosecutors present, right? The only two people who I were aware were their official uh, capacity was um, the lead detective, Ben Antaranian, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, um, and then uh, Mr. Binger. 
Uh, yes. But as for the other people, I'm, I'm sure they mentioned their names, but those are the two people that I that stuck out, I guess I should say. So the people that you recall, Detective Antaramian, Mr. Binger, your lawyer, and you. Correct. And you were asked on that day, which would be, now this is, that would be your second statement, you were asked about what had happened, right? Correct. And had you viewed some of the video between the shooting and the interview that you gave on, I think it was the 24th of September? I can't say for sure, but I would say it's a very fair guess that I had at least seen something at that point, or by that point. And in that interview, you don't answer any questions about the shooting, do you? No, I do not. <laughs> this lead detective on a homicide case where you are also shot, is trying to gather information to figure out exactly what went on, and you refuse to answer questions about that, right? About specifically about the shooting? Yeah. That is correct. Was that your decision or your lawyer's decision? That was the advice that my counsel gave me. So your counsel wouldn't let you answer questions about your involvement? True. I wouldn't say that she wouldn't let me, but she advised against it. So your statements about what actually happened, the first time that we're getting an insight as to what actually happened is today, right? I don't think that's accurate. Well, on the 24th, you refused to answer questions, right? The 24th of? September. Correct. And the day after the incident, you acknowledged you left out the fact that you even had a gun. Right? That is correct. You were asked, Mr. Binger asked you about this, you were asked for permission to look through your phone, right? I do recall that, yes. You never actually gave your phone to Detective Antaramian to look through, did you? My phone was picked up off the street the night of the, 20, the, night of the 25th. So, no, I didn't give my phone to anybody. Somebody, and I'm assuming a police officer had picked it up. My question to you, that wasn't my question. My question to you was, Detective Antaramian asked you for permission to look through your phone, and you never gave him your phone. True? I never gave him permission to look through my phone, no. Are you aware that he had a search warrant for your phone? No, I was not. So, so if I can, uh, Mr. Grosskreutz, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the video, okay? Are we going to time it? Uh, I haven't been notified that the lunch is here, but uh, I got a pop up. It'll be here in about 15 minutes. You heard what? 15, 20 minutes. I said from now. Yes, it's from you. Okay. Yes. It's up to you. What? Do you are you fine with time? You would ask for 12 to 1. Right. You are in the middle of an examination, so I will. Uh, I'll hear from you guys as to what you want to do. Um, if it's not here, I'm fine. I'm ready to continue. I just didn't know if he had a problem. I just was hoping for an hour. Whenever we, whenever okay. We I'll give you an hour whenever we stop. Thank you. Okay. okay so just, I'm going to have you stop it a lot. Okay, go ahead. I do. Okay. He's Would you like Sister Marcian's pointer? Oh, sure. It's up to you. I don't. You, you're welcome to use your glasses if you want. Thank you. He's got it. Oh, he's got it. Okay. 
see this gentleman right here, right? I do. Okay. Now, you agree he advanced on, ran after, came up to Mr. Rittenhouse, right? Can you rewind just slightly? Can you just go, you know, go back 10? Yeah. Okay. You agree that he runs up to Mr. Rittenhouse and then applies the brakes, right? I do. Okay. And you'd agree that he's feet, me to you away. And that's okay. a fair assessment, yes. Two or three feet. He's advancing on Mr. Rittenhouse, and you'd agree he puts his hands up, and Mr. Rittenhouse never fires his gun. Correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, you're off screen here at this point, right? You haven't come into the frame yet? No, I have not. Okay. That is, for lack of a better term, this gentleman right here. This is Jump Kick Man, right? Uh, I, I believe so, yes. Okay. So, you can play it. So, you now see that Jump Kick Man kicked Mr. Rittenhouse in the face and two shots are fired, correct? Uh, with this video, yes. Okay. You hear that, right? Uh, in the moment, yes, I did hear it. Okay. Now, if you can see and we'll play it, I don't, I'm not trying to trick you. This is Mr. Huber, correct? Um, it is hard to see with whatever is blocking. Okay. Um, play it for a second. Okay, that's Mr. Huber, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. Now, this person here that's just coming into the frame, that's you. That is correct, yes. Okay. And you are running, correct? Yes, I was. Okay. Now, you had originally said that you wanted, um, you were going to tell Mr. Huber to stop beating him, but now you understand that you didn't say anything. You were just running, whatever word you want. You're moving towards Mr. Rittenhouse, right? That is correct, yes. Okay. We just heard a shot, yes? Correct. Okay. And to be fair, that you put on the brakes, right? You were running. You then almost stop in your tracks. Fair enough? Correct. Okay. And I don't know if your arms are up at that point, but it looks like you're kind of protecting your head at that point. Is that fair? That is correct. Okay. How far do you think you are away from him at that point to the best of your ability? I would say about there uh, between... Um, me and you? You and I, correct. So three feet? Three to five. Okay. Now, at that point, you have your hands up, right? Yes, I do. Now, you probably don't notice him at the time, but this guy's holding up what looks like a wooden club of some type? Some sort of wooden object, yes. Okay. So your hands are up, and at that point, he has not fired at you, correct? No, he is not. Okay. It's going to be quick. You would agree at this point, you are dropping your hand, you are loading your front foot, and you are moving toward Mr. Rittenhouse at that point. True? Yes. Okay. So, when you... were shot, can you bring up the photo? You'd agree, and now wait, how close do you think you are to him at that point? Three feet. Okay. Uh, if it was five feet before, it would, so. So tell me if I've got the lay of the land. <laughs> at this point, you're holding a loaded chambered Glock 27 in your right hand, yes? That is correct, yes. You are advancing on Mr. Rittenhouse, who is seated on his butt, right? That is correct. You're moving forward, and your right hand drops down with your gun. Your hands are no longer up, and now they're, the gun is pointed in the direction of Mr. Rittenhouse. Agree? I'll give you a, a picture. Maybe that'll help. What's 
the next one? I'm going to show you what has been marked as Exhibit 67. Uh, that's a photo of you, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, that's Mr. Rittenhouse? Correct. Okay. Now, you'd agree your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, correct? Yes. Okay. And once your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, that's when he fires. Yes? No. Sir, look, I don't want to... Does this look like right now your arm is being shot? That looks like my bicep being vaporized, yes. Okay. And it's being vaporized as you're pointing your gun directly at him. Yes? Yes. Okay, so when you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. It wasn't until you pointed your gun at him, advanced on him, with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him, that he fired, right? Correct. You had now you had mentioned that you believe that he was re-racking. I think you. I don't know much about guns, but you had mentioned that you believed he was re-racking his gun or something, right? That is correct. Yes. Okay. Now this is your. I think this is right. This is your tweet from November fifth. So during this trial, you're tweeting out. Yes. Yes. And you tweet out to whoever these people are, make sure you look and listen for the defendant's firearm malfunction, and then you have a, a winky emoji face. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay. So this is, the fifth was yesterday? That would have been Friday. Friday. Time's flying, Judge. Um, so Friday at 7.45, you, and what's the winky emoji face for? I believe that was in response to uh, whoever the original, um, whoever the original poster is uh, on there. Uh, I don't know what the original post was, but it was more than likely in response to uh, this person's opinion that they had posted. Now you, you had said, that you were looking for a non-lethal way to end this interaction. That is, that is correct, yes. Yet you pulled your gun out and began, I'm going to use the word chase. You, been, you began chasing or running after a man who was running away from you, correct? That is correct. Now, you had said and you were asked about the do no harm and, and the tattoo on your arm and things like that, right? Um, you have some regrets from that evening, don't you? No. Well, Jacob Marshall's your roommate, isn't he? No, he's not. He was your roommate, correct? He was, yes. Okay. And Jacob Marshall came to visit you in the hospital. Is that right? Yes, he did. Okay. And I know he's taken it down, but not before we saw it. He posted something on either Twitter or Facebook with you, right? Correct. Do you remember that? Remember what? The picture that you guys took in the hospital together? Uh, yes, I do. We have a 
We need to talk about this. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe we should. Uh, uh, um, I assume you have more questions beyond this. Not a ton, but we should probably get this cleared up. Yeah, we might as well. Uh, let's take a break. Uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. I assume your uh, lunch will be here shortly. Uh, don't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Um, okay. See you in a little bit. I'll uh, see you at about 1.15. Thank you. <laughs>